Well, welcome to the January 11th meeting of the British Empire Study Group. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. And for our regulars, Happy New Year and very happy to have you. We use a very liberal definition of the British Empire. If it flew over it, drove through it, um, it transited by it, it's, it's all fair game here. Okay, so our next meeting will be on February 2nd, and it will be a Valentine presentation appropriate for February, and that's with John, and possibly we'll get his wife, Claire Scott, to give uh, give the presentation. Without, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my cohort, my co-chair, Rob Lutens, to introduce Ed Grabowski. Thank you, Joan. A little background on the subject of this evening's presentation, Professor A. Victor Segno. He arrived in Los Angeles in 1900, where he soon set up a business in fortune telling and palm reading as both a practitioner and a teacher. He then claimed to be the creator of the new science of mentalism and set up an organization named the American Institute of Mentalism. For the sum of a dollar per month, about $200 in today's money, he would send out his so-called success waves to his subscribers around the world twice a day and their lives would miraculously improve in the areas of love hope peace wealth health ambition happiness influence and success by 1903 he had more than 12,000 members in his success club his marketing schemes did not end with brain waves though with help from his company segnogram printing segno sold self-improvement books like how to possess a perfect head of hair, personal magnetism, and how to be happy though married. Our presentation this evening focuses on the success of Professor Segno in the European African colonies using ephemera and covers from the British, French, German, Spanish, and Portuguese colonies of that era to illustrate the case. Now let me share some background on our presenter this evening, Dr. Edward Grabowski. He spent his entire professional career as a chemist with Merck Research Labs and started collecting stamps just after World War II. Like many of us, he started out collecting the whole world, but then he began specializing in the United States and then France. Fate ultimately brought him to collect French colonials. It was while collecting this area that he first discovered there were covers that related to using the mails to perpetrate mail order fraud on an international scale. This fascinating category is now his current philatelic endeavor in tandem with his study of the postal history of the French colonial allegorical group type in their era. In 2006, his Guadalupe Postal History exhibit won the Grand Prix d'Honneur at the Washington Show. And in 2014, he received the American Philatelic Society Luff Award for Philatelic Research. During 2013 and 14, it was his pleasure to serve as president of the Collectors Club of New York. So without further ado, I give you Dr. Edward Grabowski. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Rob. And uh, I'm going to start filling you in on the details of philately and international mail order fraud. Okay, my slide showing correctly? Yes. Okay. So today's talk, as, as Rob has already mentioned, is philately and international mail order fraud with the focus on Professor Segno and the American Institute of Mentalism and the success in the European African colonies. First, I, I want to thank my, my co-conspirators in this endeavor. Uh, none of these people are philatelists, but I want to thank Philip Desleep who's a, uh, a historian associated with the University of California at Santa Barbara, Larry Harnish, who spent most of his career as a features writer for the LA Times, and then the members of the International Association for the Preservation of Spiritualist and Occult Periodicals, John Boucher, Mark Demarest, and John Patrick Devaney. Uh, these fellows maintain a phenomenal website of fraud starting from I think a little before the Civil War until uh, just before World War II. Uh, and it's a fantastic, fantastic website, which I've been happy to contribute to. 
uh, I have to begin with a warning. Uh, these lectures or this lecture may be dangerous to your health. Uh, the transmission of residual signal success waves via Zoom has not been studied to date, and I'm recommending the use of protective equipment uh, to ward off any, any bad effects from these success waves. And you can see here when I gave a similar talk at the Akron Stamp Club a few years ago, uh, all of the members came prepared with, uh, with protection from residual signal uh, success waves. Uh, so really, how did all of this start? And uh, as Rob mentioned, I was a specialist in the French colonial allegorical group type. Uh, here you see two covers with the group type of Saint-Pierre and, and Michelin, and I was collecting uh, the postal history of this issue from the 29 French colonial units that actually employed it. I was collecting all of them, plus the, the postal history of, of the period that they were used, uh, and it was while, while I was collecting this issue that I, I came upon this idea of philately and international mail order fraud. It started in 1988 when I was at Bolpex at Guy Dillaway's booth. Uh, Guy was, was really a wonder, wonderful dealer for getting all sorts of material. And I came across these two covers from St. Pierre and Michelin employing the group type. Uh, and you can see both are at the 50 team re international registered rate, uh, and they're both going to Los Angeles. And as soon as I looked at these covers, I started wondering who is this fellow, Professor A. Victor Segno, to whom they're addressed? Uh, and, and what was his claim to fame to, to warrant two covers from St. Pierre and Michelin? And I first started digging in uh, the faculties of, of uh, various colleges and, and schools in the Los Angeles area at the time, but. I, I didn't come up from with anything to do with Professor Segno. And as the World Wide Web began to develop, uh, particularly some of the uh, uh, publications from Larry Harnish of the LA Times, I began to learn who Professor Segno was and, and what he did. And as Rob uh, mentioned in the introduction, Professor Segno was a self-proclaimed mentalist who for the sum of a dollar per month or $10 per year would send his good vibrations in your direction uh, with improvements in your life in the area as Bob mentioned. He operated out of Los Angeles from about 1900 and to unite his subscribers, he formed the Segno Success Club, membership in which was part of his subscription fee. He claimed to be the creator of the new science of mentalism and formed the related organization, the American Institute of Mentalism. And here we have uh, from his book on, on the law of mentalism, a picture of Professor Segno sending a success wave. And at the left are the eight, is it eight or nine areas where your life would show improvements if you were a member of his success club. Also, we see pictures of him uh, in the early part of the 1900s and then around 1920. Uh, when he was about 50 years old at the time. And you could see the predominant feature of his presence is that is that phenomenal head of hair, which he ultimately capitalized on. So how successful was he in this endeavor? Around 1903, the Segno Success Club had 12,000 members, each paying monthly or yearly membership fees. That calculates out to about $120,000 per year, or about $2.4 million in purchasing power in today's dollar. Uh, uh, Philip uh, Deslip found a letter uh, from the postmaster of LA to the Bishop of LA, responding to the Bishop's complaints about Segno's activities. The postmaster noted that Segno was doing nothing unusual at the time, relative to the activities of many others at, at that time. Segno was actually investigated by the U.S. Post Office in D.C. in 1903, and no charges against him were filed. 
And the issue was a simple scientific one. You couldn't trap a success wave, put it in a bottle, and then scientifically show it was nonsense. The postmaster also noted in his letter to the bishop that Segno was the largest private mailer in LA at the time, sending as many as six to 7,000 letters per day and receiving thousands of letters per day. So he was one of the big mail pickup and drops of, of the city of Los Angeles. With the proceeds from his activities, Segno built a mansion and a publishing office in 1905 in the Echo Park section of Los Angeles, near today's Dodger Stadium, and from which he conducted his uh, business activities. There's also a 1911 report that indicates that the Success Club had about 70,000 members, but to date this really hasn't been confirmed. Uh, thanks to the IAPSOP, this, this is the uh, 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 investigation of Professor Segno conducted by the post office in 1903. Uh, you can see the Segno Success Club, A. Victor Segno is the one under, under review. Uh, and if you go down to the blue arrow, it says judgment entered, and it says very clearly evidence insufficient for fraud order. So, so they examined Segno and his activities and realized they could do nothing, and he could pr proceed to continue doing what he was doing. How successful was he early in the game? This is a duplex advertising postcard from Professor from Professor Segno to uh, people who are interested in joining his organization. And it tells you a lot about uh, uh, how well he had done by, by the time of this, uh, the printing of this card, which is around 1905, 1906. The picture at the left the river, the comp is of the complex that he built in the Echo Park section, the first building being the American Institute of Mentalism and the home of the Segno Success Club. And the building up the, up the block is the Segnogram Publishing Company, which handled all the publishing activities that, that he needed. Uh, the second picture part of the card uh, shows passage through the main entrance of the American Institute of Mentalism to the gardens, the court and gardens, which he called Inspiration Point. And you could see clients walking out there contemplating the American Institute of Mentalism. And off in the distance, the lake you see is actually Echo Lake, which is one of the famous parks in LA today. And you see the land beyond is just not built up. Uh, this was in the remote part of, of Los Angeles at the time. If we go to the lower right hand uh, uh, of the screen, you see the postal history of this card. It's franked with a one cent Franklin of the 1902 series from the United States. Uh, you notice the Los Angeles date stamp has no date in it, no, no day and no month. Uh, and this was a special consideration for this type of mail, which was called time independent mail. So it would be held at the post office until there was room and then it would be shipped out. And the rate for this was one cent per two ounces. And then at the uh, lower left, we see the business end of the postcard. First off, a wonderful Syracuse arrival, which gives us the date of the mailing of uh, around the, you know, around the mailing of this card. Uh, it's July 20th, 1908. And then the simple advertisement from Professor Segno. If you seek success, write to the Segno Success Club, Los Angeles, California. And you see his American Institute of Mentalism in the background. Very, very simple. Uh, a catching ad for the day. For people who wrote for information uh, uh, about the Success Club and the American Institute of Mentalism, they would send out information packets. These, uh, 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 these were typically sent out at the one cent rate per two ounces, which is the standard printed matter rate. This example is franked by one, one cent Pan Pacific issue tied by a Los Angeles station E uh, cancel station E being the local post office uh, by Segno's operations. And these informational packets contain usually a letter of introduction 
some introductory information and order form, and a self-addressed return envelope. And very, <coughs> excuse me, nicely, this example was sent to New South Wales, Australia, uh, a sort of remarkable destination. <coughs> excuse me, I just need a little drink here. So the question comes up, how large were his operations at Echo Park? We have pictures of his mailroom, pictures of his office staff, and there's about a dozen people in each, in each room. Uh, the LA Postmaster in the, the letter that Philip found uh, says that Segno employed 50 typewriters, okay, meaning uh, 50 people in the office area. So I would I would estimate around 1905 in that period that his staff ran between 30 to 60 people. So it was a substantial operation to keep it going. And by the way, in the left uh, the left picture, you can see three mailbags ready to go and three more being filled uh, by the staff. <clears throat> uh, in support of his success club and American Institute of Mentalism activities. Segno authored a number of books for his clients, which were, pre, which were printed at Echo Park by the Segno Graham Publishing Company. His major book and most famous book is The Law of Mentalism, uh, which I'll have more to say about. He also wrote How to Live 100 Years, Retain Your Youth, Health, and Beauty, Life in the Great Beyond, or The Law of Life and Death, The Secret of Memory, of course, How to Possess a Perfect Head of Hair, into this world and why, and another famous publication, How to Be Happy Though Married. I should note that Professor Segno divorced his first wife in 1903, married an employee named Annie Dell Dinsmore, who became treasurer and secretary of the American Institute of Mentalism. And then in 1911, he ran off to Germany with one of his other secretaries and divorced Annie Del Dinsmore or Annie Del Segno, uh, and and uh, married married his third wife, so he wasn't really successful at at following his own his own ideas. Uh, here's the American Institute of Met Mentalism. Languages were not a problem. Uh, the publications were done in all the major European languages. Uh, I I haven't uh, cataloged them all as of yet, but. Of course, here we see the law of mentalism in English, in German, in Spanish, uh, a private printing from 1930 in Romanian, uh, and a new French printing in 1950 after Segno's death uh, with, with a new printer and a new forward by uh, Paul Clément Jago. Uh, uh, so this, this was his major book and available in many, many languages. And if you'd like a copy today, you can have one printed up by one of these special printers who will do one copy. And here's an example of one of the Law of Mentalism by A. Victor Segno. Uh, this is one of my favorite publications. This is my copy as part of the ephemera of the uh, Segno, uh, Segno collection, How to Be Happy Though Married. And you can see the copyright in 1901 by the Signogram Publishing Company. Larry Harnish has a little more interesting copy with a nice colored cover, uh, uh, but but the uh, including the same basically the same text. And here's some of the text. Uh, he's got a poem on true love that he got from uh, uh, someone in Los Angeles, uh, and then he begins the text: How to be happy though married noting that the problem of how to be happy though married is of vital importance to every man and woman, young and old. Okay. Uh, he also for about three and a half years had a house mag magazine called the Signogram. Uh, here are some issues from 1905. And you can see that the newly produced, the newly built American Institute of Mentalism uh, at the left, the publishing company is not there yet. And at the right, you see the reception hall of the American Institute of Mentalism. If you go through the double doors, you come out into the gardens 
And if you go to the left, if you look in the left very, very carefully, you see an office and you see someone sitting in that office. And of course, that's none other than Professor Segno. The IAPSOP has put all of the Segnogram magazines that they have uh, uh, as PDFs uh, on their website if anybody wants to look at them. Hmm. Here's a su success club ad uh, for a, a ad booklet for serious clients on the road on the mystic road to success, highlighting the club emblem uh, uh, with testimonials, uh, all all sorts of stuff. It's about a 12 page booklet uh, uh, for for serious potential members of the American Institute of Mentalism. And I couldn't help but throw in the little. Uh, 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 it's, it's almost like a stamp uh, at the left, lower left that he created. Uh, that's the little advertising section from the postcard I showed you, but now in French. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm now actually looking to try and find one of these on a, on a French cover, which would be a very interesting uh, addition to the collection. Of course, he advertised in, in all the foreign languages uh, uh, major foreign languages in Europe, and here's one in German. Uh, the key thing that you see is the key. Uh, and what is Erfolg in German? Erfolg is success. And of course, what he's offering here is a free book, uh, a free booklet on, on the American Institute of Mentalism and the Success Club uh, uh, to, to potential clients. Uh, say no never, he, he, he always looked for new ways to make money at the American Institute of Mentalism. Uh, in addition to the, the fraud scam, you know, his fraud scam or scams, there were a couple of them there. He, uh, uh, he was also selling dried California fruits. He was selling California olive oil. And at the time around 1900, it was fashionable to collect silver spoons from different entities. And he produced this silver spoon, which shows the Signogram Publishing House and a bit of the American Institute of Mentalism in the bowl. And then if you walk up the handle and you see near the top of the handle, there's the key and there's success written. Uh, so you're, you're brought to think about the key to success being becoming a member of, of Segdo's uh, program. So the question is, did the good vibrations success waves work? And of course, he always had uh, testimonials in, in his advertising all over in the, in the magazine. Uh, a couple I particularly like is the first one. You no doubt will be glad to learn that since joining your club, I have improved my health, supported myself and a little baby girl and made over a thousand dollars and risen from servant to be a proprietor. That's quite a testament. Simple one from Kansas, uh, I consider your success club the greatest discovery ever made by man. Uh, so that's pretty heady stuff. I personally estimate that membership in the success club appeared to be successful for about half the members of the club. There was a high probability that something good would happen in the lives of many of the members during their membership. You might get a new job, you might have an investment success, maybe the birth of a healthy child. Maybe they were cured of what they thought to be a significant health issue, which was not. Or maybe they had something relatively minor and was cured. Or they did experience an actual cure of the disease. A similar success was experienced by homeopathic medicine at the time. And then just as a, a, a general observation, I think as a species, we are easily fooled. And uh, I think you all will remember the Fura that uh, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin caused in the current pandemic, when in fact, neither drug showed any efficacy in double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Uh, yet America was really excited and to some degree is still excited about these two drugs. Uh, the same remains true for homeopathic medicine. You can still buy homeopathic medicines uh, uh, at your CVS or, or Walgreens. Uh, but there's no double-blind placebo-controlled studies that have ever shown that homeopathic medicine works. So with that introduction, uh, let's look at Signo's success waves reaching, let's start with West Africa and then go beyond. 
And it's important to note that many of the covers that I'm going to show you are from small remote villages and not just the colonial capitals and the large commercial centers. And at the top, you see Professor Segno sending one of his success waves in Spanish from the Spanish edition of the Law of Mentalism. So let's start in the West African colonies. And this is a standard uh, 1900s, 1910 map with, with the old colors that I remember in grammar school for the various colonies. And wherever you see a happy face, that represents a colony from which I have philatelic material on the Segno organization. It's really quite remarkable to, to be able to grab all of these colonies in, in, in this collection. And we start with uh, Bathurst, Gambia, a uh, very nice registered letter at the five and a half penny rate uh, from Bathurst to Annie Del Segno in 1915. Uh, she was running operations. I'm going to do the history, the whole history in one slide towards the end of the end of the lecture on this and just make comments on what was going on at a time of a particular cover. Uh, Annie Del Segno was Segno's divorced wife who was running things because he was, he was in Germany. And I'll have more to comment about that. Uh, with respect to the British colony of Gambia as a, as a French colonial specialist, I've always wondered about how, this colony is, is, is just a river valley that cuts right through the heart of Senegal. And I asked Gary Lowe, who's a specialist in Gambia, didn't the French and British ever try and get together and uh, give, give Gambia to the French in, in return from uh, something from the French to the British? And Gary pointed out actually in 1870, the, the French and British had gotten together and they were going to arrange the transfer of Gambia to France. However, France got uh, deterred by the Franco-Prussian War and the mess they created there. Uh, followed, followed by the declaration of the Third Republic in lieu of the empire, uh, followed by the Paris Commune. So there was a lot of uh, basically stuff going on in France and, and the transfer of Gambia to France was just, just lost in the, in the mess. Go over to Sierra Leone. This cover is a very simple and inexpensive one, two and a half penny rate. Uh, uh, from uh, Freetown, uh, the, major, the major town in uh, Sierra Leone. And the interesting aspect of it is it's to the Segnogram Publishing Company. You don't see a lot of letters uh, to the publishing company. Here's another one from Freetown based on a one penny postal stationary envelope raised to the two and a half uh, a penny rate, uh, also to Annie, Annie Del Segno. Uh, just take a little, a little look at the Segnogram Publishing Company because it did play an important part in Segno's activities. Uh, this is what the building looked like. It's, this is from the Segnogram magazine, as you would no, no doubt guess. And if you look carefully above the uh, stairway entrance, you can see the Segnogram Publishing written on the, on the front of the building. Uh, here are a couple of the other publications that I mentioned earlier are and Into This World and Why, uh, which was his last publication, The Secret of Memory, uh, which was a little booklet. Uh, if you open Into This World and Why, of course, you come across a sales pitch for even more stuff. Uh, here's, here's some courses of instruction that he was, uh, he was selling at the time. And on the right-hand side, uh, you, you have an offer of copies of Into This World and Why, uh, and Why that are leather bound and you can send out to your friends as, as holiday gifts. Uh, so he was always, always selling something. He also did contract publishing. Uh, and here's a book on raising Western poultry by one Mrs. A. Basley. And if you look at the title page, uh, it's uh, the chicken business from first to last in California. And you go down, down to the bottom, and it was printed by the Segno Grand Press in 1912. He also did textbooks for the Los Angeles school system at the time. I've yet to get, to get one of those. So back to the postal history. We're now in Grand Bassam, Ivory Coast. As late as 1923, American Institute of Mentalism was still active. Segno was not particularly active in it at this time. 
And this is simply a, a letter to the American Institute of Mentalism, probably asking for further information on the Success Club or something about uh, one of the books that are available for sale. More interesting is this registered letter from Grand Bassam, now at the one franc registered rate, still the same year, 1923. Uh, the stamp being used is, is the pirogue stamp. The pirogue is the name of the boat that the natives used, uh, which, which was key for transportation throughout this part of Africa at the time. Uh, and uh, the registration was because it contained some monetary vehicle. And Signo accepted all monetary vehicles, including all currencies, all money orders, and even unused stamps. Uh, <clears throat> as as payment for his uh, for his various goods, uh, I just take a little break and show you a group type cover from uh, Cap Lopez Gabon, uh, showing the pirogue, uh, uh, and this will pop up in in a little while again. But you can see how the natives used it uh, for transportation along the many many rivers in the in the African colonies. You can see a young lad off, off to the left with his small pirogue uh, that obviously he, he knows how to use and use efficiently. So we come now to the Gold Coast. Uh, and this, is, this turns out to be a rather special colony. We have two pieces of, of postal history here. Uh, one is from Kumasi and it's franked at the halfpenny rate uh, from to Annie Del Segno at the American Institute of Mentalism. And the second one was franked at the same rate, but there was some problem. The halfpenny rate is, is the printed matter rate. Uh, the second one had some problem that was recognized in New York. Uh, we don't know what that problem was. It, it could have been the letter, the envelope was sealed. Uh, it could have been somebody had written something on the printed matter, but it was treated as if it, it should have been sent at the two and a half penny rate. So we have two pennies unpaid four pence due, and that's equivalent to eight cent due US on arrival. And you can see the eight cents in US uh, postage due stamps applied to the letter. Going back to the first one, we have the question, why is printed matter being sent to Professor Segno, Annie Del Segno, the American Institute of Mentalism at this time? And I had various thoughts on this, but I think the most obvious one is Based on the death, based on the date and rate, uh, someone is sending holiday greetings to Professor Segno and the American Institute of Mentalism. Uh, uh, obviously a happy client. Uh, here's an example from a small village, uh, the Kita, 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 Kita uh, at a one penny rate. Uh, it turns out there was no one penny rate from a British colony to the USA. Colonialists often assumed there was, and they franked accordingly. Uh, there were one penny rates from the British colonies to Great Britain and colonies, and there was a one penny rate from Great Britain to the USA, a special rate. Uh, I have many colonial letters from this period, Franklin era at one pence uh, to the USA, which allows for studies on how under Frank mail was handled. In this case, the post office at, at Quito did not note the under franking, they just passed it on. And it's been a general observation of mine, both in the French and British areas, when the sending post office fails to recognize an under franking, letters proceed to their final destination without postage due. Uh, this seems to be true, except for letters going to Switzerland. The Swiss always caught under franked letters. And you can see this particular letter is addressed to the Life Culture Society. That was an entity that actually prepared the book into this world and why and marketed it. And it's the only cover I've seen uh, to, to the Life Culture Society. Uh, here's a properly treated hey penny letter that had a problem uh, <clears throat> and everything was done right. You see the hey penny franking. Uh, the post office at Cape Coast, uh, Gold Coast recognized there was a problem with this. They struck it with their teeth for postage due. And then when it arrived in New York at Penn Terminal, they recognized it was in insufficiently franked and used their duplex due marking, where you can see the due eight cents, 1916. 
And then very nicely, if you turn this letter over, uh, this is World War I, remember, and we'll have something more to say about that in a bit. Uh, and it's got a nice censored date stamp from the Gold Coast uh, with the initials ER, which are probably the initials of the person doing the censoring. Uh, so this, ha this captures a wonderful array of, of postal history elements uh, from, from the Gold Coast. Here's one from the village of Mangoace, uh, 1916, at a two penny rate. But again, there was no two penny rate. The rate was two and a half pence. Uh, <clears throat> but the office at Mangoace did not catch the deficiency and sent the letter on and the letter reached uh, uh, the American Institute of Mentalism without incident. And you can see the whole censor tape now uh, that was being used uh, uh, at, at this time. Uh, here's a double weight registered letter from the village of Dodawa uh, showing use of the ACRA sensor hand stamp and the one penny war tax stamp. Of course, this uh, 1918, 1919, 1919, the war tax stamps came out. Uh, and I have a couple of examples from, from the Gold Coast. It's very nice. Here's a simple, proper two and a half penny uh, letter from, uh, from ACRA. That's the, the uh, main city in, in the Gold Coast with a very nice pass, pass by sensor hand stamp. Uh, well, from the Gold Coast, we come to German Togo, and I've only seen two Segno, or I'm only aware of two Segno covers uh, relating to German Togo, one in my collection and one in the late Lou Pataki's collection uh, of, of German colonies. This one is from uh, Atakpame in Togo, uh, it's properly franked at the 20 Pfennig German overseas rate. Uh, the rates went two and a half pence uh, overseas for the British, five cents for the Americans, 20 Pfennig for the Germans, and 25 centimes centavos uh, for the uh, uh, French and Spanish, and centissimi uh, 25 for the Italians. So this is this is a very nice one. Again, you see it's one of the pre-printed envelopes. Uh, and, and what happened in Togoland is the British and French, <coughs> as part of their World War I activities, began a campaign in Togo to take it over from the Germans. Uh, and the Germans were defeated by British and French forces from the Gold Coast and Dahomey. Uh, in Togoland in the Togo campaign from August 9th to 26th, 1914. There's a picture of the British, British forces uh, involved in the uh, 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 colonial war and, and occupation. And then Brit uh, German Togo was occupied jointly by the, by the British and French thereafter. So here we have uh, from, from, again, Togo, the Togo op occupation, the Anglo-French occupation, 1917 registered letter at the four and a half P rate uh, to the American Institute of Le uh, Mentalism with a nice use of the sensor tape. Again, we're bringing in some, some interesting philatelic elements into this cover. Uh, also, the name of Hollingsworth has been crossed out in the pre-addressed uh, envelope. And uh, they, they were just, uh, I don't know who Hollingsworth is. He was a real estate uh, tycoon in LA in 1917, 1918. Had some association with them, uh, but apparently they, they didn't need these envelopes for his use. So they obliterated them and typed in American Institute of Mentalism. Here's a very interesting one from the village of Tsui. In, in German, former German Togoland, part of the British French occupation. The, the uh, British decided to use an old Sui date stamp uh, that was from the Gold Coast usage. And uh, they, they tried to blank out the Gold Coast. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure with leather or, or something. Uh, and this didn't take too well. Or initially, initially, it was done in a very clear fashion. Uh, and, and looked like this, <clears throat> but that quickly came apart over the years. Uh, and, and you end up with different states of wear on this cancellation. The other interesting aspect of it, it, this is actually at a two pence rate, that's not a two and a half penny stamp from the Gold Coast. And again, it was missed. Uh, so it simply went through and, and this uh, 
letter has, has some proper back stamps, so we know it went through the mail. Uh, from the French side, we have this re uh, letter from uh, 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 Neko Togo uh, from the French British occupation. You see there are some more names on it. The names of Hollingsworth, Lawson, Vendome reflect newcomers to the American Institute of Mentalism. Professor Segno was fading into obscurity at this time. You can see we have the Acris has sensor hand stamp and the issue being used is the native climber um, issue of, of Dahomey that has been overprinted uh, for the occupation letters. Here's one from Dahomey employing group type stamps uh, to Professor Sago via Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, <clears throat> and here's a little more interesting one from Wida Dahomey employing the native climber issues. Nice use of the 35 centime stamp. Uh, and uh, you've got the uh, uh, Wida registry. This one went via Paris, probably up to La Harve and, and then on to New York uh, and into the American postal system. Uh, then we come to uh, Nigeria, and of course we have Southern, Northern, uh, and Nigeria itself. So from Southern Nigeria, this is from, from Lagos, uh, uh, the, the major population center. Interestingly, this one is addressed in Spanish, Club Exito del Segno. Uh, here's one from a small village in Southern Nigeria, Barutu. Uh, uh, two and a half penny weight pro uh, rate, proper, a very proper rate. And then one from Kano, Northern Nigeria, uh, which contained money for the purchase of something that Segno was selling, we don't know what, uh, but it's a very nice example. And then finally, from Nigeria, uh, the colony of Nigeria, uh, simply a 1936 letter registered letter that's addressed to Segno. He was no longer part of things in 1936, but his name was still prominent because it was on all the products. And here somebody is writing to the numerology department, uh, a new shtick uh, uh, for these, for the Segno organization, uh, whoever was running it in, in 1936. And this is based on a piece of Nigerian postal, uh, postal stationary envelope for registration. We have the French occupation of the Cameroon. This is a simple letter from Douala, uh, Cameroon to the American Institute of Mentalism, 1916. It's five centimes overpaid. Uh, I don't think this is philatelic. I, I've, I haven't seen any philatelic mail to say no. Uh, I've, been, I've been searching the uh, Zeppelin mail uh, extensively. Remember there was a Zeppelin called the Los Angeles uh, and uh, hoping to find some Segno mail uh, via Zeppelin, but I haven't found that. Uh, but here we have the, the uh, uh, stamp from the middle Congo uh, overprinted for uh, Cameroon and the, and the French occupation. And we come to a very interesting one also from Cameroon, uh, French occupation of Cameroon. It just has, has a lot of unusual aspects associated with it. The stamps are, the overprints that I just show you, but they've been blotted out by uh, problems with water and problems with the cancellations. Uh, it is the 50 centime registered rate from the village of Ebolowa, W-A. But if you look at the date stamp, it is Ebolowa, N-A. Uh, the French incorrectly spelled the name of, uh, name of this village uh, and that date stamp held until 1924 when they corrected it, which is quite interesting. Uh, you can see the German registry labels we use. The French did not prepare any new registry labels. They simply used the German. The British did the same in, in, in their occupations. And if you look carefully, you see in, in manuscript underneath the registry label, it says register on the left. And then on the right, you see AR. So a return receipt was requested for this uh, registered letter. And then the last aspect about it that, it, that is interesting uh, is that apparently while traveling in one of these pirogues, there was some problem and the mail sack carrying this letter fell into the water. 
and and the, the the whole thing got waterlogged and we can see outlines of some of the contents of uh, of of this letter uh to the cabarones and finally the last uh, uh last item from this is from fernando po yes a spanish colony little island colony off of the african coast it's a double weight registered letter uh, I think it's the real highlight of, of this section is 65 centavo, centimos uh, uh, rate uh, to Professor Segno's organizations in 1914. And uh, uh, you can see from the back, it's lost its seals, but it does have its uh, Madrid arrival and it traveled via the Spanish system. It's very, very rare, very unusual letter to Professor Segno. So how did Segno do it? The first thing is he had good advertising at the local level, okay? This was probably handled by locals who were in contact with the Segno organization. They worked through them to handle the advertising in local journals, local newspapers uh, uh, to, to promote the American Institute of Mentalism. And this is something that Philip Desleep also found in, in, in his searches of the web uh, and this is a, a short article in the Cape Coast uh, or the Gold Coast leader in Cape Coast uh, uh, with the editor of John D. Uh, uh, o2, 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 I guess. Uh, uh, and, and what the editor is quoting is a paragraph from Segno, from the Segnogram magazine. So it's quite obvious that, that uh, at least in the Gold Coast, Segno was getting local support uh, from, from so, some of the local newspapers. Uh, and this, this brings me to a very important point uh, that I'll put, it, put as a question first, and that is what country shows the most Segno letters, okay? And when you think about that, you would think, well, maybe it might be Britain or France or Italy or Spain, one of the really big European countries. But the answer is the country that shows the most letters to the Segno organization is the Gold Coast. There are more than 36 letters known to the Gold Coast. I have 17 in my collection uh, and I don't have more than, I, I don't approach that from any other country. So it's, it's quite amazing how successful Professor Segno was in, in the Gold Coast. So what about the rest of Africa and, and related areas? So here's something from Cairo, Egypt, December 96, 1912. It's not quite a British colony or a French colony, but certainly I'll, I'll argue Egypt had a lot of French and British influence in, in its history at this time. And this is a printed matter two million rate uh, printed matter item to Professor Segno, again, bringing up the question, why was printed matter being sent to Professor Segno? And it's the same answer, it's holiday greetings. Okay, you notice the date, December 1912. Here's a regular letter from Alexandria at, at the five million rate. Uh, that's the over, overseas rate to Annie Del Dinsmore, still her maiden name. Uh, who is listed as the secretary. As I said, she was the secretary and the treasurer of the American Institute of Mentalism. Uh, here's a rough rough one from Algeria, but it's, it's the best I can do at the 50 centime French rate with the 50 centime uh, Tip Mersan issue of France. That's the, the proper issue in use at the time. More interestingly is, is one from Safi, Spanish Morocco, February 4th, 1912, registered to the Success Club at Inspiration Point. Uh, and the interesting aspect of this is actually, this is from the Spanish office in French Morocco. Uh, the French, a lot, the Spanish apparently had a lot of goings on, a lot of commerce relating to, to uh, activities in Morocco and the French allowed them to actually run a post office, a Spanish post office. And you can see from the back stamps, it went from uh, uh, Tangier to Madrid uh, through the Spanish system and then up into uh, 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 New York and then, and then Los Angeles. And finally, if you will allow me uh, calling this Africa, one from Funchal, uh, Madeira, uh, 1905. 
uh, uh, of course, Funchal was uh, uh, part of Portugal, but pretty close to Africa. And you can see this is the 100 rice uh, registered rate to Professor Segno. So even in Madeira, people were aware of Segno and his activities. Well, that's North Africa. Let's get over to East Africa now. And, and we come to another Portuguese entity, Zambezia. This is from the small mining village of Teta, which is way up the Zambezi River uh, uh, to the American Institute of Mentalism. And it's franked with 250 centimes Zambezi stamps, plus a two and a half centavos Lorenzo Mark stamp for a total registered proper rate of 12 and a half centavos. It's got a nice registry label from Teta and it's got the British uh, censorship in South Africa. Uh, where the letter passed through the British system. And then if you turn the letter over, it's got, of course, the war tax stamp from Portugal that was used in Mozambique uh, for a final rate of 13 and a half centavos. Uh, you can see the rest of the registry label, a really, really spectacular cover. Uh, this one seems small potatoes by, by comparison. It's from Penholonga, Southern Rhodesia. Uh, however, it's at the proper two and a half penny rate. It's from a small village. And this is the earliest recorded Segno cover in my collection. It's the earliest recorded Segno cover I have seen. In 1905, Professor Segno recognized the potential value of his covers and I believe began selling them to the philatelic trade. He was selling stamps via the Segnogram magazine that he was cutting out letters to, to stamp collectors uh, at the time. And to kind of prove that Penhalunga was a small village, uh, here's a postcard which shows the first hotel in Penhalunga. And you can see it, it wasn't a particularly glorious place to, uh, place to stay. Again, this was a mining community. We come to finally the South African complex, the British South African complex. We've got a few letters from interesting places, Port Shepstone, Natal, at the two and a half penny rate. Wonderful registered letter from Premier Mine Transvaal, uh, employing the uh, stamps of the Union of South Africa uh, with censorship tapes, censorship hand stamps, two different ones. Really quite a spectacular letter to Annie Del Segno, uh, who was running operations at this time. Here's one from the Orange River Colony from Krugersdorp uh, in, in 1911, also registered. Uh, and also from, we do get them from, or I do get them from the main areas, uh, the big cities. Here's one from Pretoria, Orange River, River Colony in 1911, uh, also franked at the same uh, uh, six and a half uh, rate. So where do I finish this little tour? Uh, well, I'd like to finish it in Madagascar. Madagascar is really not part of Africa, but it's pretty close. It, it had a lot of African migration from the continent of Africa to Madagascar. A lot of the population is African. And here's an everyday, most basic French colonial group type letter at the 25 centime rate from, the Tanana, from Tananarive, the capital, uh, to the American Institute of Mentalism. And it just looks like an ordinary letter. But what's interesting is the use, not of a Madagascar group type stamp, but a Grand Comore uh, uh, group type stamp. And it turns out in 1911, Madagascar independencies was made the overruling entity of, of everything associated with Madagascar, and including Diego Suarez, Nasi Bay, St. Marie de Madagascar, and the four Comoro Islands, Andron, Bayat, Mohili, and Gran Comor. So, and the stamps could be used interchangeably. So we see the issue of Gran Comor used from Tananarive. Also from Tananarive, but a substation, you see the two area, nice combination of group type and native bearer stamps at the, at the 25 centime rate. There's one on the, on the reverse. Uh, and to show, uh, uh, you know, I, I can get material from small 
smaller villages, his one from Fenerive, which is uh, along the coast, uh, east coast of Madagascar on the way to Tamate, the major port city. It's franked with stamps of Mayotte, the 1912 overprints where France was trying to get rid of all the group type issues and overprinted them 05 and, and 10, the most common rates. And interestingly, look at the address on this one. It's the Chirological College of California at Inspiration Point Echo Park. This was a signal entity. The Chirological College was the first fraud entity created by Segno in 1900. It was an entity for palm reading and fortune telling, which never amounted to much, yet was never closed and covers occasionally appear. In the whole collection, uh, I have nine covers to the Chirological College. Here's one to a genuine small village in Madagascar with group type and native bearer type uh, 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 stamps prepaying the 25 centime rate. I just wanted to show you the native bearer stamp. Uh, in this stamp, the background city is Tananarive. You can, you can see the, uh, uh, the church and the, the main building where the queen lived uh, uh, until she was thrown out and the French took over. And, and the hills are very, uh, are very hilly and steep. And that's the postman being carried by four native bearers. So if you, if you wanted a good job in Madagascar, you, you would want to be the, the postman. Uh, and finally, the last uh, letter touches on a very interesting aspect of Madagascar postal history. Beginning 1899, the French realized they could not provide new date stamps quickly enough for the newly opened post offices. They were conquering territory so fast uh, at the time. So they instituted this system of numeral cancels that were used on a provisional basis until date stamps from France arrived. That often took six to, tw six to 24 months. <clears throat> and so it's become a, a subsidiary area in Madagascar to collect numeral post offices and try and identify where they were from and when they were used. As they were pulled from service when date stamps were provided, they were simply recycled back so you can get the same number used by a couple, by a couple of couple villages. Of and there's a group of us who collect uh, this data fastidiously and send it to a fellow named Jacques Desnaux in France who keeps tabs on, on these. This letter is particularly nice First off, it's franked at the proper 25 centime rate with stamps of Mohili and Anjouan, the overprints. Uh, and it bears the Madagascar 84 numeral cancel. I should note these numeral cancels were used from 1899 to 1939. So it was a well-established system. And we have the return address and we see that the, the sender of this is actually from an area called Fararohitra, which is a suburb of Tananariv. Uh, and so we can make the association of, of where this date stamp is being used from and the date is being used. Just one of the little side, side aspects. So that's the end of the postal history. I'd like to take a little time to remember Professor Richard Maisel, who was president and founding member of the British Empire Study Group. In his real-time job, Richard was a professor at New York University, where he taught in the mathematics department, specifically the area of statistics. And if you knew Richard, you, you knew that he was always publishing articles involving numbers and statistics and philately. He approached philately through statistics. So remembering Richard, I'd like to take a statistical look at my signal covers in the in this collection and what does it tell us for those of you who don't didn't know richard uh here he is this is from a uh dinner of the british empire study group where we gave him the order of the british empire study group in recognition of all the work uh he had done on behalf of the the membership in the group so what i've done here is i've got about 275 covers in the collection and I've done a plot, the x-axis, the years 1905 to 1937, the y-axis, the number of covers I have for each year. And you can see there's quite a variation over, over the years of existence. 
And <clears throat> I think this variation relates to what was going on at the American Institute of Mentalism. So let's, let's look at the comment section, the good in blue and the bad in red. 1905, Segno builds his Echo Park complex. He recognizes that he could sell postal history uh, to the philatelic trade, and so it begins to appear. 1906 uh, through eight, we see the success of the Segno Success Club with lots of covers uh, being available from those years. And then suddenly something happens in 1909 and 1910. What's going on there? And we know now that the Segno marriage to Annie Dale Segno begins to fail. In fact, in 1910, she was, she was uh, treasurer of the organization. Uh, 1911, Segno married yet another secretary of the American Institute of Mentalism. And he left for Berlin to start a Segno Success Club branch. And Annie Del Segno began running the American Institute of Mentalism. And you see 1911 to 1914 were really good years for the American Institute of Mentalism. Uh, and the Segno Success Club. However, things drop down a bit from 1914 to 1919. Uh, the, it, it's hard to run a, a international mail order fraud during a world war. That's ba basically what it tells us. Also in 1915, Segno returned to LA from Berlin, a total failure. And the Los Angeles Times ran a, a major article that said, uh, uh, Mars destroys success waves, okay, Mars being the god, god of war. Uh, and after 1915, little is heard of, of Professor Segno, but Annie Del Segno keeps running the American Institute of Mentalism. 1920 to 21, again, collapse of activity. <clears throat> and what we know in 1921, Annie Del Segno was being sued by her lawyer for failure to pay for her divorce in 1911. So 1920, 21, the American Institute of Mentalism was on hard, hard economic times. It comes back a bit in the 1920s, uh, but then is forced out of business basically by, de by the depression, 28, 29, 30, no covers, and then just a few covers in the, in the mid 30s, 35, six and seven. Uh, uh, and and what what we see, of course, is depression impacting the American Institute of Mentalism, and people don't have the extra money for all of this all of this nonsense. So what happens to what happened to Professor Segno's properties um, in in Los Angeles? Uh, there's the American Institute of Mentalism and the publishing company and the uh, card I showed before. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't these properties have been a wonderful home for the Museum of the City of Los Angeles? You could exhibit Angelina Ward in these spooky buildings with all of this history, it would have been wonderful. Or <clears throat> maybe some benefactor uh, would, would buy the publishing building uh, for the LA Collectors Club and library uh, possibility. Well, none of that came to pass. In the 1970s, Professor Segno's buildings were demolished to make way for the Lago Vista condominiums, which you see in the picture at the right. And you ask, how do I know I'm at the right place in, in Segno history and Segno buildings? Well, if you look at the palm trees in the postcard at the left, they are newly planted. Uh, you look at the palm trees uh, in, the, in the picture at the right, they are spaced correctly. They're now more than a hundred years older. Uh, and I think, I think we've nailed the property where, where Segno's uh, buildings were, but uh, uh, no longer exist. In uh, 2012, Philip Desleep, Larry Harnish and I had a meeting of the Segno Success Club uh, at, uh, at Sescal, okay? The big uh, national stamp show in Los Angeles. Uh, we spent a whole day discussing Segno and various aspects. Larry picked a restaurant for our luncheon uh, uh, near LAX, uh, and it turned out in, the, in its gardens, the, the restaurant had mock-ups of famous airplanes. And so we had a passerby take our picture uh, under the Spitfire, one of the most famous planes of World War II. 
Uh, and by the time this uh, uh, PDF reached me, uh, it looks like Professor Segno has appeared as, as the pilot of our plane. Finally, I need your help, okay? I cannot search the cover boxes from every dealer at every show. I cannot search all the websites. I cannot search all the auctions for these fraud covers. So I always ask my audiences when searching for your covers, and if you cover the 1900 to 35 period, uh, be on the lookout for certain addresses in the covers. And there are the Professor Segno addresses, which I've, I've mentioned during the course of the talk. A second organization I collect is the New York Institute of Science of Rochester. Uh, names associated with it are Ex Lamont Sage, Charles S. Clark and the Cartilage Company, Yaxi Pathor Company of Buffalo, which uh, 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 sold a, uh, a medical device. Uh, and then James W. Peebles, the Peebles Institute of Battle Creek. So if you come across of any of these covers, uh, make me aware of them. You can find my address very easily with a, with a Google search, <coughs> also any ephemera. I'd be very interested in learning about these. Maybe you have some covers in your own collections that you'd be willing to part with. And if you successfully bring me a cover, you get to be a member of my slide of fame. And these are all of the people who brought covers to my fraud collection. And you see a lot of famous philatelists here, Mark Banchak, Gary Lowe, uh, Bob Stone from France and Colonies Group, Richard Maisel, Greg Schultz from the uh, Akron Collectors Club, the Harmers, yes, I've gotten material from the Harmers, uh, Kathy Johnson, John Hotchner, uh, Mike Mead, Mike, Mike was wonderful. Every show I'd show up uh, at, at, he'd have a stack of fraud covers for me. Arnold Selengood helped me discover um, uh, <clears throat> the Oxypathor Company. Uh, and if you find an item or two, you get to join the slide of fame. And today I'd like to welcome to the slide of fame, Loic to friend of Ariel. Uh, who's a good friend from Aragon and a member of Colfer, the French Colony Society in France. And he's the one who brought me the Dahomey cover. And if this lecture hasn't been enough uh, for you, if you want more, I've actually written a chapter uh, for the European Academy of Sciences on the very title of this talk. Uh, it's about a 16, 18 page chapter that will appear in Opus 23 of the European Academy of Philately later on in the year. Uh, and you can see most, most of the slides that I've used with a lot more text uh, and informational material if you'd like to read that. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'll be happy uh, to take comments, uh, questions, whatever you wish. Thanks a lot, Ed. That was a wonderful presentation. We've got some questions uh, um, from Daryl and Mary Frances Templer. They're wondering, were there other Indian Ocean usages like Seychelles, for instance? Oh, of course. Uh, I was a member of the Indian Ocean Study Group. Uh, and in, I guess, during the teens uh, of, of this century, uh, I did an article on uh, Professor Segno uh, and uh, mail from the Indian Ocean colonies. And uh, uh, I call their attention to that article. It's in, it's in the uh, Indian Ocean Study Group, British Indian Ocean Study Group publication. And if you, if you Google that or if you go to their website, you should be able to find it. All right. In, fa in fact, the cover that Gary Lowe brought me was from Mauritius. And of wow. course, I, I, I have some covers from Reunion. Uh, and uh, I guess, where else? I gotta be careful here, maybe French India, but it's all in that article. All right. Um, what was the span of years for the several Gold Coast letters that you had? Um, I think the early, the, the latest was 1919. Okay. And I think the earliest was, was a little before 1910, but I can't remember the specific dates. Okay. But the Gold Coast is, is absolutely marvelous. I mean, that's a, that's a search term for uh, 
uh, uh, eBay and Del Camp that I use on its own. Nothing gets mixed with that because, uh, I mean, there's some really, really good. I, I don't have all of them. I mean, some of the Gold Coast collectors have them. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of uh, aware of that in the UK. Someone was wondering if you've compiled any any evidence of duration for individual memberships. Have you been able to track uh, any any of the uh, followers? Yes, just just through correspondence. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a fellow in the town or village, uh, probably a town of Molina, Chile. And I have about a dozen or more letters from him to to Professor Segno. All of them are registered, which means they contained money. And they cover a four year period. And this guy, this guy was spending loads of money with with Segnum. We have no idea who he was and 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 what he was up to. Uh, but uh, it, it didn't matter, though, because as fast as 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 Segno lost members, you know, the world was his source. OK, I, I have letters from from uh, the New Hebrides. I, I got letters from Sarawak. Uh, I, I've got letters to, uh, you know, all over the world from Segno. He, he could attract, he could attract customers, uh, uh, you know, just, just, just from all over, all over the world. It's just, just amazing. So if, if he lost people, he could bring on new people. I, I, I you know, it's like P.T. Barnum. There's a sucker born every minute. Yeah, right. Hmm. Okay, we have a question from John Bunsma. Was there any connection with Amy Simple McPherson, who also had a huge building next to the pond in Echo Park? Uh, not that I know of. Okay, I I, I don't know what she did, uh, but there's a uh, uh, in the, uh, the in the publication that's coming out, and and uh, also I have an article on the success of the New York Institute of Science in Hungary. If you Google that. There's a, a book put out by the AMA and the United States Post Office. The, the issue I have is 1921. It's 800 pages and it deals with all the fraud organizations that these guys were dealing with uh, in the early 1900s period. And there may be something in a, uh, on this uh, woman uh, if she was involved in any fraudulent stuff. Uh, they did know one another, by the way. Uh, the IAPSAP uh, website has an interconnection uh, diagram of all the fraudsters. I, I mean, there were hundreds of them. Uh, a lot of them didn't use the mail, so they're of no interest to me. And, and they show the connectivity. I mean, Professor Segno was well connected to the New York Institute of Science and all their schemes. He knew all about them. He worked with them at times. He advertised. Uh, in in his Signogram magazine for them, you know these guys knew what what they you know they were all doing. And uh, yeah. um, Jerry Cole shared with us that a major reason that the British and French jointly attacked German Togoland was the fact that the Germans had a powerful radio transmission station that was relaying communications between the German Imperial Command and their Atlantic fleet. Uh, there's a question. Do we know if that radio tower still exists? Wow, that's that's way beyond me. You have to. Okay. I, I, I've heard about this. Uh, the, the, the question yeah, brings back. Oh, yes, I've heard about this, but I can't remember where, where or when. So uh, I, I, I don't know what 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 still exists. Uh, actually, if, if, if you know the location, you could just go to Google Maps and uh, <laughs> see if you could find it. Um, another question. Is there a broader census of the number of signal covers known? No. Uh, I, I, I thought when I started collecting uh, specifically Segno uh, that it would be unending. OK, that that with especially Del Camp and eBay uh, and, and the, the amount of material that they that they handle, I would I would continually be finding covers. Um, I've yet to find anything in the last eight weeks. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. it's 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 almost as if uh, 
the Segno fraud, you know, it's it's like I've got most of them, and I know of another dozen uh, that various collectors have, or or that I've seen in sales. Uh, but uh, I I don't know how many more there are beyond my two hundred and seventy five. Uh, but I it doesn't seem to be a lot. Okay. But they do, they do the fraud covers do show up in people's collections. I've I've actually. Oh, yeah. I've actually bought them at the frames uh, at some shows. In fact, uh, Dave Steadley, who's who's on on my slide of fame, uh, I, I bought one of the fraud covers right out of his collection when we took the show down. So, <laughs> okay. Do we know anything uh, more about the professor in his later life, like when he died? And he died in 1940. You know okay. Okay. Uh, but he he. He seemed it, he came back from Germany in 1915 and just seems to be very, very quiet. But his name continues to appear on, on the letters uh, because the products that they continued to sell all had his name on them. So he was part of the advertising and whatnot. But uh, we, we have no indication of a significant presence after 19, 1915. Do we know if he belonged to any philatelic organizations? Uh, he didn't. Okay. No, no, and no information with uh, on on that they, that he had any philatelic associations. He did. He had advertisements in the Segnogram magazine. I think he's for ten cents you could get twenty five foreign stamps. Pretty pretty good origins on them too. Uh, uh, he was selling that. No, no ads on postal history, though. He wasn't selling postal history. I think that was going to the trade, and that's that's why I can find it today. Uh, the New York Institute of Science is even a better example of that because they were bigger uh, and and uh, much more prevalent, uh, and I think they sold to the trade also. We have a question here. What was was the professor a professor of nothing what was his background <laughs> nothing he we, we 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 know he came out of canada uh, uh we if you go to the iapsat website they they give his early history uh a victor segno is a nom de fraud uh it's it's not his real name he emigrated to the united states he claimed he was born in chicago for his passport uh in 1900, he also shows up in New York City uh, with the guys who created the New York Institute of Science, and they created a fraud organization in New York City. Uh, and and Segno was was writing some stuff for that, uh, but then moved on and out to Los Angeles. And the, the the fraud guys in New York City also gave up, and they went up to Rochester. Uh, you know, maybe the people in New York City were too smart, and and you know didn't didn't bite on this sort of stuff. You you had to go more to the provinces. Uh, I, I have that feeling. Uh, the New York Institute of Science. I have more than 150 covers from Hungary. Okay, wow. I mean they were really taken by this stuff. Just a few on Segno, but uh... all right. Well. I takes care of our, our written questions. Now, if we have any of our viewers that have their hands up, we can start taking questions directly. We have Bob Vogel. Yeah, uh, Ed, that was a very entertaining uh, presentation tonight. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm just wondering what got you started? Did you find a hoard of these covers? Or Nope. nope. Once, once I recognize, well, the first thing I did was go to my group type collection. I, I didn't dig into the details of that. But I, uh, when I sold the group type in 2019, I, I had more than 2,700 covers in that collection. And, and I was smart enough, thanks to Robert P. Odenweller, who told me about databases back in the 1980s. I, I still have a simple DOS level database with all this information. And so what I did uh, when I recognized Professor Segdo was a, a fraudster that I wanted to collect, I did a database search of my French colonial covers. And, and lo and behold, I found, I don't know, I think it was 16. 
uh, in the collection to the various addresses, Chirological College, American Institute of Mentalism, Annie Del Segno, A. Victor Segno. Uh, I, I, I found those all in the database. I pulled out those covers. I, I had an attempt at a one frame exhibit on uh, Professor Segno and uh, philately and fraud in the French Empire. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Pat, uh, Pat, the judge, Patricia Pat Walker. Walker. Uh, Walker, Walker, yeah. Yep. Uh, Pat Walker uh, uh, went through my exhibit. She wasn't judging it, but she just went through it. And and she's just laughing all the way through it. And, and she came over to me and said, you know, one of the biggest laughs she ever had just going through that exhibit. It was so much fun. Uh, and and the the real judges of the show gave me I, I don't know a small bronze or something like that and I said oh boy uh, <laughs> this this is very this, very impressive thank you this is tough so uh, Bob Rose thank you Joan uh, hi Bob hi Ed wonderful presentation I have a question about how it was that this material was discovered or found and, and got into the philatelic marketplace. I mean, yeah, oh. I had an office, there was an office in Los Angeles for a lot of years. At some point, did some philatelists happen to walk into it? No, I, I, I think I think uh, Professor Segno was selling his covers, you know, it might have been a dollar for a stack of a hundred, something like, you know, he's getting thousands every day. And and he had some local local philatelists in LA who were buying them, uh, and you know they they had some very interesting origins as as you've seen from the talk, and that put them into the philatelic market, and you know that was that was in I don't know 1910 1915 say thereabouts, and then in uh, 2000 and uh, uh, whatever it is 15 Grabowski comes along. And start searching cover boxes, okay? And and when I first started, I had a pretty high probability of, you know, you you'd run into uh, a, a cover dealer, uh, or what's his name from from Arizona who has lots of covers, and I I'd, I'd see him at uh, 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 what do you call it, Westpex, and I just sit down for an hour and dig through his box, and I find three or four or five or six covers to fraud organizations, you know, they just show up in, in regular stock. Um, <clears throat> Guy Dillaway, I bought a lot of fraud covers from him. And uh, so they just work their way into, into the philatelic sales system and collections. And, and I've been finding them. Okay. And as I said, I, I mean, I found, I found a really great one in, in the last Harmer sale. Holy gee. Uh, it, it, it was from a, a pre-fraud organization when these guys were just starting up. It was the New York Institute of Science, but a wonderful, wonderful cover in terms of postal history from South Africa, if I remember correctly, Joan. Uh, and, and franked with one penny stamps and all sorts of markings. Uh, and it was a Philadelphia fraud organization that the guys who ended up in Rochester were practicing with. <laughs> and and it's it's absolutely wonderful cover. It's just a chance happening. Uh, Joan has has one in her uh, morning collection to Professor Segdom. I'm surprised she didn't show it today. Uh, <laughs> not to Africa, so uh, or from <laughs> Africa. But you know, uh, Wade Sadi. Oh my gosh! Once I started talking about this, Wade Wade comes up to me and he shows me this cover, unpaid. From Argentina to Professor Segno, 19 teens, whatever the right year is. Uh, so it's postage due. It's it's a uh, the rate in American currency is is five cents for an overseas letter. So it's ten cents due, and it's got a ten cent parcel post postage due stamp on it. Oh my gosh! I told I told Wade once I I'd, I'd kidnapped his wife and I was holding her for ransom for that cover, and and mm. he looked at me and he said, "Ah, keep the wife." 
the law. No, I mean, it's a phenomenon. The, the, the APS uh, expert committee. I, I don't know how I was down there visiting Gary Lowe and, and started going through things. And I came across another one of these uh, parcel post postage due stamps on cover. And it's also the professor saying, no, I have no idea where that cover is, but it's in somebody's collection out there. Okay, and, and I, I have, you know, at least two dozen covers that I'm on the lookout for, but I, I don't find, if I go to Dell Camp, I go to eBay now, uh, I rarely find a cover. If I do see one, it's a $10 cover they want $80 for, and I'm, I'm not going to go that way. That's great. Jerry, you had a question. But before you do, Ed, next time, I'm going to have to get you over here before the next sale to go through all the large lots. So I know to increase the price. <laughs> uh, great presentation, Dr. Ed. Uh, all of the covers that you showed were from uh, Africa and you know offshore. I'm sure there were a lot of people that were members of uh, uh, the organization that lived in the States. Do you find covers? No, no. The, the, the interesting thing is, uh, the United States is one of my less exciting entities, okay? And the reason is, I think I think the U.S. covers to and from Segno were considered common and everyday. So, so there was no, you know, no, no, nobody really saved them. But the foreign ones were were just of greater interest. So I find it very, very hard to find U.S. covers. I may have let's say 12 u.s covers to segno and and or you know you think that's preposterous <laughs> because you know he had, he had to have the united states was unquestionably uh his his main uh, uh main area of success uh but you know a lot of those uh, of those letters going out with a penny uh, uh one penny printed matter stuff nobody saved that uh i, I i've seen a, a little bit of the ephemera that were in those uh, uh, letters, informational letters, but I haven't found a whole package for the New York Institute of Science. I've, I found whole packages, both not only in English, but in French and in Japanese. Mm. Uh, it's, it's much, much more interesting, but the US material for Professor Segno is, is difficult. And then when you do come across it, it's a two cent rate or you know, maybe a five cent rate uh, uh, coming in overseas. From, from a major place, it's nothing particularly exciting. But they, they, they might exist in, uh, in, in dollar boxes someplace where nobody's, oh, sure. Really, sure. nobody's really, you know, notices it's from Signal and, and, and catalog it as such. But, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Coverman was somebody I, I used to see regularly. He had lots of boxes and I, I spent a lot of time with him and uh, got a lot of Hungarian material. <laughs> Uh, got a lot of European material, but uh, not nothing from the U.S. It's just and and somebody um, uh, I'm having trouble with names now. Uh, one of the the deal is from Mar Maryland. The guy who plays golf. Uh, oh, uh, LeBron. LeBron James. Uh, no, LeBron James. No, Le yeah. LeBron Harris. LeBron, as Mary used to say. Yeah. Uh, uh, he knows of my interest in, in the, the four fraudsters and, uh, uh, he and Mary used to look for covers, uh, for me and, uh, he's not come up with a lot of us material. The, the one fraudster where you see, I see a lot of us material is Dr. Peebles and, and, uh, Dr. Bobo, uh, they, they were out of Battle Creek, Michigan. And for some reason they were. <laughs> Americentric, uh, I, I created that term, uh, and eighty percent of the covers are are from the United States. So that's that's my U.S. collecting area, and that 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 got me into the United States Stamp Society. So uh, again, a very 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 interesting talk. Uh, you know, Bob Vogel and I'll have to start looking through uh, the the dollar boxes at the shows up here in Canada, so we can find something. Oh, I, if you guys look, I, uh, where people haven't looked, I guarantee you will find, you will find hey, something. Honey. Hey, are you home? Richard, you, you have a question. 
Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I found it very interesting. And I was wondering if you uh, will have eBay dealers on your slide of fame, because I sold you uh, 15 covers from e on eBay in October, I think it was October 2021. And uh, they came out of, um, I think I bought them at Westpex at the Rum uh, Rumsey. Uh, it was one of the postal history <laughs> auction lots I purchased at, at, at the <clears throat> Westpex sale from Rumsey. Uh, and I don't know any more specifics about uh, where, you know, the lot it, it's. But uh, I, I found it interesting to, to write those covers up for eBay. And uh, I think there were 18 total and you, you won 15 of them. What, what countries were they from? They were, they were all foreign. They were all over. I can, I still have a record of it. I can, I don't recall, but I think it, it was, it was quite broad and, and, and uh, uh, several, several British colonies. Okay, well, send, you you should have my email address. Send me send me the list. Sure. Uh, and I have to put you on the slide of fame. Uh, okay. See, stuff that comes from eBay and Dell Camp just just gets logged into the database as eBay or Dell Camp. I'm still maintaining a database on <laughs> on the fraud covers now. It's very very useful. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, when I come up when I came up with the Chirological College. I just looked through my database and I found the chirological covers, you know, and I knew exactly yeah. what I had, where it was from. It's a There's very, one very other, po powerful yeah, one tool. other question. Um, it, it, if memory serves me correctly, it seemed to me that the small group of covers I sold on eBay, there were two addresses in Los Angeles. Yeah, well, there's a, a, a series. Uh, oh, go, go ahead, continue. Uh, no, and one was one was the one that I can recall was the 701, but there was another one. Uh, the, there were a, a few covers from a, I think, a different address. Yeah, the, the, there are various versions of the address, and when Segno, when, when the fraud uh, scam was at its height, you could just address it to Professor A. Victor Segno, Los Angeles, California, and they had no problem in getting it to him. By 1925. Uh, they couldn't find him. Okay, I have a I have a letter that actually was seeking Professor Segno, and and you could see the post office trying to get in touch with him. And they couldn't find him in mm. 1925. We knew he was alive because in 1931, mm. little things I didn't get into. Uh, uh, he apparently came up with the idea of uh, uh, selling what he called lucky shekels, and these were made from a, a substance that he found in Israel uh, that was traced back to 1891 BC. And he was cutting lucky shekels from these things, which mm. would bring wonders to your life. Mm. And the FTC brought him up on a fraud charge, uh, but, but there was never any follow-up. And uh, I, I'm also looking for one of Segno's lucky shekels, uh, if, if one ever, ever comes up. <laughs> David, you have a question. Hi Ed, uh, the I really I really enjoyed your talk, but as a postal historian, I have to know what about the reverse direction? Are there many uh, interesting covers from the Segno or uh, from Segno or organization? No, the re the reason is they a they were they were not particularly exciting covers in terms of the franking, and b they weren't going to collectors. They were, they, were, they, were, they were going to people who were susceptible to fraud. Uh, so they, you know, they, it's the mail they threw out. They opened it up, uh, saw the offer and, you know, maybe uh, wrote a check, got a money order and ordered up a membership or a book or something like that. But, but they didn't save the, the Segno stuff. No, it's, it's the same with the New York Institute of Science. It's a little better. I have some nicer postal history, but it's it's not the volume you would expect with the volume of outgoing mail that they had uh, mm. because the letters were just not saved. Okay, ordinary frankings, printed matter frankings. Uh, and, you know, I, I, as I said, I've been looking, uh, oh, voraciously uh, through the computer databases at the, uh, you know, the Airship Los Angeles looking for a signal letter. 
that that you know went on that airship for some reason somebody uh, just just can't find one okay. uh, thank you uh, so richard again on the... uh, good good evening ed um Hi. i i would like to take up the um the fact that you can't find any uh, covers addressed to the United States. I too have an interest in bail order uh, from a company in Britain and all the overseas stuff. And I'm just wondering whether uh, there was a separate department for, for in the organization for stuff which had come from overseas. And that might be the reason why you can't find American stuff. Uh, I, I, I generally, what I've been able to glean, and this comes primarily from the New York Institute of Science, they actually had a desk for each country or each language. Oh. They had a Spanish desk, they had a Hungarian desk, they had an Italian desk, they had a French desk, and they had somebody who was, who was not only conversant with the language, but I think conversant with the, 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 the economy of the nation involved, what's going on, because you know, they were working to arrange all, I, I, I mean, the, 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 the publicity, especially like the New York Institute of Science, I, I've got the publicity book, booklet for that from Hungary now. Okay, and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's really amazing the things these guys could do in foreign languages. Uh, and, and so I think they had these desks and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I still, I, I don't think there was any difference in handling other than the fact that U US letters were generally not appreciated, except for Dr. Peebles and Dr. Bobo in Battle Creek. There I, I have some, some nice stamps, uh, uh, very you know, good usages of, of, of like Trans-Mississippi and, and uh, I'm, I'm still looking for a five cent Jamestown uh, have, I haven't seen that one, but uh, uh, so it, it you know keeps keeps me looking. It's it's a lot of fun and it doesn't cost a lot of money uh, <laughs> until now. Uh, <laughs> Mike White, you have a question or comment? I, I don't particularly have a question, but nice to see you again, Ed. Hi, Michael. And. <clears throat> A wonderful presentation, but I kept getting this feeling I've seen it before. Is oh, that you, you? You may have. What what happens? This presentation builds, uh, and especially the ephemeral part, and 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 what I change is the is the Phil, is the postal history part. But I did give this presentation on on Africa someplace. It might have been France and colonies. Uh, I don't know where. It might have been uh, Society of Postal Historians. Uh, I, I can't keep track of these things anymore. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm I, too I, old, and uh, you know my my computer database is kind of a little weak, and I don't know where I put things. They're all in logical places, but but well, I, I I know the feeling. The uh, the yeah, yeah. the other thing, which is a question, is that <clears throat> I'm wondering what percentage of of mail was registered given that oh. most of it most of it would be containing money yeah the the the, the mail going going back to signo uh, where people were buying stuff is it, it registered you know it registry is an important search term for me Okay, yeah. I, I will I will do registered Los registered Angeles, okay, or registered Rochester for the New York Institute of Science, registered Buffalo for Oxypathor, because uh, 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 you know a lot of the letters coming in were 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 registered because they contained some monetary vehicle, mm. and as I said, these guys accepted all; they didn't fool around. They took stamps, you know, mint stamps. Uh, did they take they promissory notes? Huh? Did they take promissory notes? Uh, probably not. I, they, were, <laughs> they were too smart for that. <laughs> no, I mean, these guys were, you know, Sego was running a scam with uh, 
the guy from the New York Institute of Science, E. Virgil Neal, they were running a scam in New York. Uh, I forgot the name of it. I have one cover. Uh, it's a U.S. cover from, from that scam. And that's the only one I've been able to find because no one was selling them into the into the uh, uh, collector system, you know, selling them to dealers and, and whatnot. Uh, but Signo was, he, they were running some sort of bank operation in New York, actually right at where Lincoln Center is now. It's kind of neat. Uh, uh, they, were, they were in an office building there and, uh, before they split up. Mm. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful to see the uh, ephemera mixed in with the ordinary post and the uh, unordinary post, especially the uh, West Africa, which I thought was very, very good. And, and that's my area, uh, not so much West Africa, but, but censored mail and, and certainly the, the Gold Coast uh the the first one that you showed the, the the circular one can you recall what what the date was uh not off the top of my head no uh, that's well, that's the uh, one with the er uh writ written over the date stamp no that's the one with the uh circular door, door ring circular that, that says uh, censored Gold Coast. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That. Yeah. That. That's the one that somebody wrote wrote over uh, uh, e e er and crayon over it. Uh, the initials yes. of the censor. <clears throat> I, I mean, I could look that up, and I can't. I can't do it from here, but I can look it up in my database and see when I bought it, what I paid for it. I might have gotten that from uh, one of the British dealers. Empire Auctions. I've gotten a lot of nice covers from him. Mm. Uh, I just the, found the, re the reason I I'm asking is because, according to the uh, antique West African Study Group's censorship book, it's only recorded in in April, uh -huh. April fifteen. So I, I was thinking maybe that date can be extended, or is it the one that they've recorded? Do you want me to pull the slide deck up again, Mike? Would that help? No, no, no. no. Ed, Ed can send me a, an email at some point when he can leisurely look it up. Okay. Yeah, I'm writing a note to myself here to send you that censored cover. Uh, and I'll send you all the details with it. It's all in the database. Yeah. That's the nice thanks, thing about thanks, it. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, that's. But that's this is, this is the being. thing, the else thing I look a... forward to, you know, hitting a cover where I run into a specialist and I've really got something special. Okay, I, I, that happened with uh, one of the uh, uh, New Zealand do markings. Uh, that I had on one of those one penny covers that should have been two and a half P. Uh, for, this was New York Institute of Science, but uh, it turned out uh, I ran into a bunch of guys, you know, who are collecting these things. And, you know, they said there are only four known. You have the fifth one. Holy gee. Uh, and and I, I, I've got a number of strikes like that. And, and that, that's what you try and do, because a lot of the covers are very common, especially like my French covers, oh, they're sadly common, but that's all I can I can do. Uh, yeah, the the earlier French covers are not that common, though. You're not going to find those. Uh, well, I, I started in you know my earliest cover is nineteen nineteen oh what I say five. Uh, that's where you know that's that's the earliest I have. I, actually. I go, I get, I'll go earlier with the New York Institute of Science and Dr. Peebles. I actually get 1899 uh, there. They, they started a little earlier. Great. Yeah, one, wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. You're wonderful. Did anyone play with the language translation? 
no takers. Mm. We tried. <laughs> the the only the only thing that uh, I got which was different was subtitles as it was speaking. So you could turn those off, or you could select the language. I, I didn't try the language. Yeah, I'm, so I'm big enough at English, so why should I try French or Italian or anything else? Yeah, well. yeah, Joan. Uh, his American was almost as good as my Canadian, so I understood it very well. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have the Canadian, the English, American to Canadian translation, right? No, um, but. I was excited about it, so. Well, you know, we, we always say the sun never sets on the British Empire study group. Tonight, we've had uh, viewers from Brampton and Sligo, Ontario, England, Scotland, Germany, Argentina, and Ireland. So that's a diverse audience. Well, hmm. I, I, I hope I come up with some more signal covers. <laughs> You hope they come up with more signal covers for you, right, Ed? Yeah. Well, it just if you collect that period, you just look. I mean, uh, we'll have Rob, to make sure we post your list on there. Rob, you missed Southeast Asia with Mike White. Oh, of course, you certainly did. It's early morning for me. I'm just having my breakfast. I I noticed somebody that I know lives in Australia. I missed that one too. Wonderful. Ed, you mentioned a couple of times where you're getting these books, the IOSOP, is that was it? IOPSOP, yeah. What is that? I that 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 is a website on fraud that is maintained by the three guys, Busher, Demarest, and Deveni. That, that's their hobby or their life's work. I'm not sure which, because they write articles on, on fraud and put them in, the, in this website. And any, like uh, uh, my papers, some of my presentations, uh, they let me put them up on that, we, uh, you know, that website for Segno and the New York Institute of Science and uh, the Oxypathor. Uh, by the way, a little, little publicity here, it's gonna be a big Oxypathor article uh, in a coming American philatelist. So uh, keep keep an eye out at the Oxypathor is a medical device that oxygenated the blood and cured all diseases. And uh, Whoa. When, that when I travel around giving a talk on that, I drag an Oxypathor along and hook club president up to it. <laughs> I usually have him or her monitored uh, by uh, MDs in the club. So, you know, we keep everything right. proper. Uh, I, I come from a scientific background, so. Yeah. Uh, Sabina, Sabina's here. Remember Sabina in the club? She she used to she was our hall monitor. When, oh yeah, when yeah. We at the club, so welcome, Sabina. There was You're someone else here here too, Mary Conroy. Yeah, Mary. She she checked out early because she has grandchildren visiting. Uh, she's she's in Colorado. She wrote the book on one of my fraudsters. And uh, uh, I contacted her when I got a copy of this book and caused her to put out a new edition with now some postal history in, in the book on uh, E. Virgil Neal, the, the fraudster, which I felt, I felt good about. But she's, she's been, uh, well, we've been both following one another since. She's a specialist in, of all things, Russian history. But mm. some, somehow she became aware of Neal through her Russian oh. interactions. Mm. And... Uh, uh, I got in touch with her when I read her book and her section uh, on E. Virgil Neal. Uh, and so she's been, she's been following along at Stamp Club Lectures, actually coming to the Collectors Club and the British Empire Study Group yeah. with some regularity now. Yeah, she's, she's fantastic. She always has a great question. Like, mm -hmm. You could tell college professors because they, they never have the like, easy questions. They're always <laughs> well thought out worded but it was nice to see everyone in a great new year so mm. is there anything else for ed and it's getting late for you isn't it yeah i gotta make supper i'm still hungry 
Uh, yeah. We got we got one of these uh, fancy cakes from Gold Gold Belly. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, buy foods through the mails, which we do now. And this is a special baker in North Carolina, and uh, I had a piece of this fancy cake before before the talk to give me energy for it. But uh, now I have to go back and have my pasta and meatballs. <laughs> Well, I always wanted to do one of those fundraisers. They had during the pandemic. They had this uh, fundraisers, or not fundraisers, or parties where everyone gets a wine and cheese basket beforehand. And I'm like, well, that's a little weird to sit there in front of a TV, you know, a Zoom <laughs> audience and munch down on your wine and cheese. But uh, it makes me think of the old British Empire meetings we had at the Collectors Club. Huh? Uh, we always had food. <laughs> And wine. We had a we had I have to tell everybody who's left, we had a talk on transatlantic mail at one of the British Empire study groups and, and uh, uh Joan prepared a, a, a whole dinner that was the last dinner on the Titanic <laughs> for the members of the British Empire study group. We had a grand grand time. And, uh, it and, was uh, Carol and it was the day the Titanic sunk, so I yeah, had to do right. something special. And and Keith Keith yeah. Keith brought along some wine if I remember correctly yes, and uh, he had some Trump Chardonnay and he made me drink it. He actually <laughs> took a picture of me drinking it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good for a cover or two, right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. wow. Well, anyway, nice to see everyone. Thank you very much. There's some I see Mark and lots. Of Great audience. And Tony, of course, Tony Warren, Carl, Frank. I like Frank. Hi, Chris. Is, is David Handelman there still there or did he he drop off? Um, David dropped off. You 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 don't know who David is. No, David's here. No, David's here. Yeah, I just yeah. Oh. I don't see you. There. <laughs> You're, you're 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 the David Handelman, right? Yeah, from, from, yeah. from Ottawa. Yeah. 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 He's the he's the world's expert in AR markings, AR covers. He, he amongst was, other things. Huh? <laughs> amongst other other things. things. But it's the it, it's the the AR covers where our paths have crossed, crossed regularly, and uh, uh, he. I, I would just drop you a note, Joan. He he would make a fantastic speaker if you could persuade him. Uh, uh, well, subject. If you were here, we'd feed you. But yeah. <laughs> by the way, uh, I ju just to mention, I, I I have a signal cover from a place it doesn't, and it's an AR cover too. It's from uh, uh, Prancy Pay at, at Sao Tomo, Tomo, Toma, the St. Thomas and Principe. Wow. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. That 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 that's in the Caribbean, right? Uh, well, it's a uh, no. It's uh, yeah. Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because you mentioned once that you you wanted to trade for it, so I assume you don't have one. Well, could could I don't remember it. Could you send me a scan? Yeah. Well, it's in my AR exhibit. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I know, but that's that's pretty big stuff. <laughs> Saint Thomas and Principe was a Portuguese colony. I think it's an island off of Africa. Africa, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, that would make yeah. sense with the Madeira cover. <clears throat> yeah, right. Oh, nice to see. Nice to see you, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm sorry. I was. Uh, we were watching the uh, Leslie and I were watching the presentation on. Uh, we'd fed the video to the TV in the den, so uh, there was nothing to show. There was nothing to see in the uh, stamp room. Uh, but I'd love to get the funding. They should make a philatelic network. So when you go on your smart TV and you have all your apps like Netflix and Amazon. Yes. It should be, you know, the philately champ. Exactly. 
24 7 something's going on somewhere yeah yeah, yeah. what what would it be philately and only philately yeah 24 7. <laughs> philately <laughs> uber alles <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, Larry, Larry Haber just last, just last week was doing a presentation to the um, the German um, Bundes group uh, of philately on um, and he was even though he's speaking to the German group uh, it was of course conducted in, in English it was on uh, the Matchens I believe so it's a uh, global enterprise especially now with the translations becoming available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with that. So, and the begin the beginning of the presentation was my first awareness that there was um, uh, real time translation available on Zoom. That's uh, quite an innovation. Oh yeah. <clears throat> well, we are an early adopter here, so much so that I had to like strong arm Zoom for three days to uh, to get it on our account, but uh, I. You know, I just think it's a phenomenal thing, especially for philately with with everyone all over. If we could start communicating, having international presenters and making them feel comfortable listening to the presentations, I think it would be terrific. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how game I'm going to be to have a, you know, a non-English speaking speaker, but, you know, I'll have to try that. And unfortunately, the, the host of the the host of the event has to have the software. So I can't just join any Zoom meeting and get translation. Mm. It will come. So. Anything else? We're all quiet. We're all hungry. Yes, time to go. Good morning. Well, thank I'll you, Ed. Up. This is okay, thank you, great. Ed. As you Thanks a lot, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, Happy wonderful. Thank you, Ed. Perfectly did. Bye -bye. Great presentation.